Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 30 of Stroke Cast. Katie Harris is my guest this week, and she is the first guest to appear on both StrokeCast and Two Minute Talk Tips. If you'd like to hear more about the role of public speaking in the medical profession, be sure to listen to our chat over at twominutetalktips.com slash Katie. But in the conversation here today, we talk about Katie's career working with stroke survivors and other neuropatients, a field she never really expected to enter, much less love and specialize in. The neuro community is a tight one, and Katie talks a lot about that bond. In our conversation, we talk about some of the stuff nurses do that patients may never see. The insight into the details of care, especially what's going on in the background while we're busy focusing on recovering and, you know, not dying, is really interesting in its own right. So who is this Katie Harris that I'm talking about? Katie has a PhD and an MBA. She is a registered nurse and is the nursepreneur mentor who has empowered hundreds of nurses to monetize their knowledge and skills in business while inspiring them to change the way healthcare is perceived and delivered. She strives to undo the perception that nursing care is limited to the hospital setting. Despite her many degrees in nursing and business and all her experience, none of her various jobs really gave her what she wanted, a flexibility so she could spend time with her son, have control over her life, and have the opportunity to, you know, make more money, which is the core reason why many of us work. She spent the last decade building nursing businesses for herself, her friends and colleagues, coaching, consulting, courses, contracting, clinic management, etc., before creating the Nursepreneur Business Academy, a one-of-a-kind business mastery program uniquely for nurses. Through her intensive mentorship program, Katie shows nurses how their nursing knowledge can transcend the hospital system and turn into a profitable business. Katie mentors through one-on-one coaching, live events, and, of course, her signature year-long mentoring program. She's an international speaker who's been featured on ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox News, and The Huffington Post. She's also shared her innovative mentorship work on national and international podcasts and TV, including Be Efficient TV, Dubai One, and Copy Chief with Kevin Rogers. Katie is a serial nursepreneur and single mom living in Philadelphia with her son, Matthew. So now, let's meet Katie. Katie, welcome back to uh, StrokeCast, our first real episode after one of the legendary and now the only legendary Lost episode. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks for having me back. (laughs) So so let's uh, let's start off with... um, why did you get into nursing? You know, uh, for me, nursing uh, was something that I had an epiphany for. It was something that just kind of came to me one day, which is it was it was very shocking for my family because I, I went through the high school things of I'm going to be a judge and I'm going to be an astronaut and I'm going to be this and that and everything else. And then one, one day I woke up and said, I'm going to be a nurse. And my family was like, yeah, okay, whatever. So, um, you know, and I, and I persisted, but nobody in my family is medical in the least. We don't have any, like nothing, no allied health or anything. So it really just did come out of nowhere, but it was, it's like the one thing in my life that I've always been absolutely clear and certain about. And I, I can't even tell you why it was just something that said, you need to do this. So something about the field just resonated and with such clarity that you've really been able to build everything else uh, you do around that that core of it and figure out how to apply that into other areas, even outside of the strict clinical context, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, with nursing itself, obviously, there is so so much stuff that goes into that. And, you know, obviously a lot of stroke survivors, you know, have some basic familiarity with nursing, but don't really encounter the whole 
structure of the hospital environment until, well, they have the stroke and are sort of thrust into it. So they don't really understand the roles of doctor, nurse, CNA, PT, OT, and, and, and have to get that, that sort of crash course of an introduction. What is the, the role of the RN in caring for neuropatients? You know, I really see the nurse as the person that's in charge of everything. That you know, The nurse is actually orchestrating all of the care that the patient is getting. So everybody comes to the nurse first. The doctors come to the nurse. How was the patient's night? PT comes to the nurse. Can we work with this patient? Case management comes and they'll say, you know, what are the family dynamics? The family comes and everybody comes to the nurse. So she is the one person that knows every piece of what's going on with that patient. And she's very, uh, you know, I want to not to genderize nursing, but she is kind of like the, the mother hen. Like she's the one that everybody's going to go to, to ask the questions. And then she's dealing with, or he is dealing with, um, giving the medications, making sure that the patient is safe, making sure the patient's getting what the patient needs and making sure everything flows the way that it's supposed to. And it's something that even hospital administration, when they want something fixed, they always turn to the nurse and they'll say, well, you know, nursing can do it because they're always there. They're always in the front lines. And, uh, you know, so it, I, I think that's the role of being the conductor of kind of the hospital system is really what the nurse does. She just coordinates everything. Yeah. What, what's interesting is the nurses, uh, as I've learned more about what was going on behind the scenes, really seem to be the folks who are working more across silos. While, while I was inpatient, the folks I spent the most time with were, you know, my PT and my OT, followed by uh, probably the CNAs, the Certified Nursing Assistants, uh, and with a, a spattering of the uh, the the, volu- the health uh, volunteers who are the ones doing a lot of the blood pressure checks and things like that. And the nurses were coming in to check on check on me, make sure things were going okay, give me my meds, and probably the doctors themselves were the folks I saw the least of when I was in the hospital. But it sounds like the nurses are just doing a ton of that other operational stuff and cross silo coordination behind the scenes, even if the patient isn't in contact with the nurse directly as much as they are with some of the other folks. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny because when we started doing multidisciplinary rounds where we bring all those people together, it's the nurse that's in Oh, do you know physical therapy? Do you know this person? Do you know this person? And, and she <laughs> brings everybody together because she has to work with all of them. Right, right. So neuro itself has its own, uh, is it's really its, its own world in the hospital as compared to some of the other, you know, diseases and trauma and heart and all this other stuff that goes on and, and the other fields that people, that people deal with in the medical context. So what was it about neuro and, and stroke recovery that, that drew you to this specialty? Well, I got to be honest with you there, Bill, because uh, there were two things that I said I was never going to do, and I was never going to do night shift, and I was never going to work on the neuro unit because (laughs) I just did not, you know, the brain, it's just so complicated, and it's scary. Neuro is scary. So, you know, fate would have it. Uh, My first job was working nights on a neuro unit, (laughs) so (laughs) so much for absolutes, and, uh, you know, it was just something that I really learned to love it, so, and, and what I loved about it was that because um, neuro is scary, right? Because most people don't understand the brain and how it functions. They kind of repel it, just like I was saying, you know, absolutely, I'm not going to do it. That's what everybody says when they get out there. I'm not going to do neuro. But then you get in there and you learn the specialty and you become really an expert in this topic and you build a community within that topic. So the other nurses, we all know neuro. We have the special neuro nurse bond, right? So if we get another nurse that is pulled to our unit, 
that nurse you can see is like visibly scared to be there. And we all kind of bond and we're just like, well, we'll help you. Or, we'll, you know, they get very possessive of the patients and they'll call a nurse out and say, you need to do this. You need to do that. Uh, you know, the other nurses will make sure that the care gets done. So I love that community feel and that uh, sense of belonging to something that's bigger and, and you know, just uh, has so much potential. And a lot of nurses, neuro nurses, uh, are stroke certified or they're, they're neuro certified. They, they have this very strong ownership within that community. And I, I just, I love that aspect of it. The team and the other folks you end up working with and bonding with and almost in, in, in an almost familial way can make a big difference in, uh, in dealing with some of the the more difficult things it's and it's interesting how you know those those big restrictions on what we think we're never going to do you know the universe has a way of saying oh, oh you think so huh <laughs> it's true I, I try not to challenge the universe too much <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like another uh, pt aide that i once worked with uh where i was asking him why he went into pt instead of ot or something else and he was like well i looked at ot and i decided i did not want to deal with uh bodily fluids so i went into pt and uh yeah the joke's on me <laughs> <laughs> So obviously, uh, like you said, neuro is is intimidating for a lot of folks. And I think from a patient perspective, you've got patients where, you know, if something is wrong with your leg, it's a lot easier to articulate that. But as a neuro patient, you're not necessarily in the position to easily articulate just what's going on because the data you need to explain what your problem is, is is corrupt because the source of the data is messed up. So uh, there's obviously a, a lot of very difficult things about that. But what's the toughest thing about working with stroke patients? Uh, I would say really there's there's a couple things that is difficult. One is is that um, you know nurses neuro nurses tend to develop an intuition over time. So it's something that's very difficult to teach new nurses that are coming on or into the specialty or nurses that are being pulled from other units. Uh, Cause I can walk into a room and look at a patient and get a bad feeling and know something's wrong. Whereas, you know, it, you can't teach that. It's just something that over time you get this experience. So that in it, in it of itself is a difficult to learn how to work with stroke patients. But also, again, like I said, the, the brain is extremely complicated. So when we have patients that have the traditional left-sided uh, stroke that results in, in right-sided weakness, uh, those patients tend to be very depressed. And you know, there's some level of grief that you're going to experience as a stroke victim, however, um, there is a more profound type of depression that comes with left-sided um, strokes that can be very heart-wrenching. And it's not that, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for the patient, but it's a very deep chemical response that they get that's more profound than just grief. So that can be that can be very difficult to, to deal with. Um, and then the other one is the opposite, the right-sided brain strokes. So they have a completely opposite uh, reaction. And uh, I've had patients where they'll have the strocularity. So I'll have patients that I'll go in the room and you could say, oh, you know, Mr. Jones, you had a stroke. And they'll start laughing. They think it's the funniest thing. And it's, it's very strange uh, and awkward. But those type of patients tend to be the most difficult because – if let's say the left side of their body is not working, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times they don't recognize uh, that the left side is not working or they don't acknowledge it. And it's, you know, it's, not a, it's not a denial. It's simply the brain doesn't recognize that the left side of the body exists and or that it's not working. So those patients will think, oh, I got to go to the bathroom and they'll get out of bed and they're pulling the left side of their body with them, not recognizing that it's not working and that they you find them on the floor. So <laughs> those are patients that are very different because they won't, you can tell them, oh, your left side's not moving and I, they just, they don't recognize what you're saying. Yeah, that's that's really interesting how that plays in. I remember in uh, in 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 my inpatient days, the team was always coaching me to 
go ahead and check my left side because uh, I was my stroke was uh, right side. And they're always like, go ahead and, and check that. Make sure you know where your arm is. And every now and then I would look down and, oh, my left hand is now between the wheel and the frame of the wheelchair. I should probably get it out of there before I start moving. <laughs> right. And, and, yeah. and it's funny how that that stuff just just happens. And, and it wasn't like I lost any feeling, still had all my feeling. It was just, you know, oh, let me go check. have to go remember to check where the, where I put that thing. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting phenomenon of the brain. Like there's really no sense or experience that you that we as humans have that can't be taken away with the right stroke in the right location. So your ability to sense and feel and understand everything about the world is, uh, you know, it can be taken away. It's not something you can just get over it or power through it. You have to do the work and figure it out and understand and find ways to compensate and work around it. Absolutely. So obviously, the most of the time when we think of care, we think of that inpatient context. But that is really only the very beginning of a long road uh, of recovery and the marathon of recovery from a neuro condition. So what was it that first got you interested in the idea of post inpatient or transitional care for neuro patients? You know, that really came when I was working as a nurse practitioner. So I was working with uh, the stroke patients, the neurosurgery patients, and we found that uh, sometimes it was difficult to get the patients to leave the hospital because they were scared. When you're in the hospital, you have nurses coming in and, and out, and if you have a headache or you have a, a tingling sensation, you can ask somebody about it. And, you know, you might get the, oh, you're fine type of response, but there's something very, very comforting about it's not a problem type of response. And then they go home, and all of a sudden, there's not the hustle and bustle. You don't have 50 people coming in your room all hours of the day and night, and everything I imagine becomes just kind of quiet and still and and all of a sudden if you feel a twinge or uh, some unusual sensation you don't always know what to make of it so one of the things that the patients will do is call the outpatient office and the outpatient office especially if it's after hours that call goes to the resident the residents in the hospital running around seeing who knows how many patients and, and their and response. They've probably been up for 24 hours. <laughs> That's a good chance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're exhausted and they're getting a phone call from a patient they may not even might not even know. And, uh, you know, they're the patient's really just scared. Right. So uh, but the, the residents are busy. Their response is always, well, just go to the ED and let them check you out. So then the patient comes to the ED and then I get them the next day. And and, it's and, kind of like, and just to just to be clear there, ED is same thing as ER. Yes, the emergency department. Uh, so they come from the emergency department to my unit and then – you know, it's just kind of like, well, this could have been settled with a simple phone call or just a simple, not just a phone call because they made a phone call, but somebody to just listen to what you're saying and just just listen. That's all they really need is somebody just to listen. So that's when I got this idea of, well, in, when you go home, why not have a service where you can call somebody who actually knows you, knows your your care, knows what you've been through, uh, or and you know just have somebody that you can talk to, maybe send a text message to or an email and say, hey, can we talk for a second? Just something. And I did this with a a, a patient that had left the hospital and he was so scared to leave. And I said, look, just here's my cell phone. Call me if you need anything. And you know the next day he called me like once. Of the following week, he called me once, and then I never heard from him again. But you know, I, I feel like that was enough to prevent him from calling the office and ending up in the emergency department for something that was easily settled by phone. You know, I remember when I got home, one of my first thoughts was, "Okay, it's quiet now. Now <laughs> what? What's next?" Right. And that's a you know sometimes they just need a plan like what what's next uh, you know how do you start that recovery process and having a plan is is something that uh, is very helpful and you have a plan while you're in the hospital and then you go home and it's just kind of like well like you said now what having a plan in place even if it's a plan that you ultimately end up changing 
every week tends to make so many things in life, not just stroke recovery, but just in general functions you want to pursue in life, goals you want to pursue in life. Everything suddenly becomes a lot easier when you just have a plan and it doesn't have to be a perfect plan, but just a plan for what do I do now? Right. And we can anticipate like 95% of the issues that are going to come up. Like we know what is going to happen when you go home. It's just that when you get discharged, uh, there's there's always, there's never any time to do anything, right? There's never <laughs> any time to sit down for three hours with the patient. It, and we've spent years learning this stuff. And then we send people home with a 10 minute discharge instructions and, you know, a packet of 50 pa- pages of, of discharge instructions that basically say nothing. Uh, <laughs> right. But, you know, we can anticipate a good portion. So if we had a plan to help the patient when those questions arise, I think that would would be helpful as well. So that's that was kind of the thought process in in uh, transitional care. You know, with all of these questions that patients and everybody have, um, what do you wish more survivors and caregivers or even aspiring medical personnel knew earlier in the uh, the stroke recovery process? You know, I guess what I wish that people knew or could maintain throughout their recovery process is just that the patient's perception or their their kind of the mindset of how they're thinking about the whole process really dictates a large part of the outcome. And I, I found this when I did my dissertation. I did my dissertation on subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is when a brain aneurysm ruptures, when it when it bleeds, and it causes. It's a different type of stroke. It's a um, a bleed type of stroke, but they end up with a lot of the the same type of uh, deficits. So. In that patient population, I took the middle of the road in terms of severity. So there's patients that have very little severity and then people that are very, very severe injury and then the middle of the road. So I took those middle of the road patients and I said, okay, who is going to do well? We have this one group. They all have pretty much the same deficits and it, it came really came down to their perception. I had some patients who just perceived the uh, this disease state or this condition as just devastating. It was the worst thing that could ever happen and they didn't do well. It's, it was, it, you know, and then I had these other patients that saw it as a second chance in life and they thought, you know, I, I've been doing nothing or, you know, I, I didn't like where my life was going and this happened and now I'm going to do what I really want because I've had that sense of mortality and the sense that, you know, I, I don't have, I, I have a finite amount of time on earth and I want to do what I want to do. And, you know, it, it seems kind of obvious after doing the dissertation, but at the time it wasn't so obvious, but patients that have that mindset of, you know, no, my life isn't what it was, but now it is what it is and I need to work with what I have and they do much, much better. A lot part of that then also seems like it plays off of what we were talking about, about having a plan and having goals and figuring out what you want to do with the situation that you find yourself in. Yeah, absolutely. And and also for medical personnel, because we, we don't want to take hope away from anybody. You know, even statistically, if everybody does horrible, but a couple people do well, you know, we relay that statistic and we talk about how you know, reframing the way that you look at the outcome is, can also help. It, it you know, you're you may still have the deficit, but even in our in our hospital system, we have spine patients, the quadriplegic patients, and you know, a lot of times we'll get those patients and they'll think, oh well, if that were me, I would just want to die. But you know, a lot of those patients, the ones that are able to change the way they think. Uh, you know, there's certainly that grieving process, but they can go on and, um, you know, their outcomes are, are much different than the people that think that they do just want to die, you know, from after that. You know, in some respects, there's there's the old, um, I think it's Henry Ford quote, or it's attributed to him often of, if you think you can or, or think you can't, you're right. 
and and in some cases that may be oversimplified. There may be barriers that actually, even if you really really want to do something, you simply it simply may not be possible with the world laws of physics. But I can almost guarantee, in terms of neuro recovery, especially. And and really, most things in life, if you're convinced that you can't recover, that you can't do something, you won't ever be able to do it. Right. And it's not that you want to minimize, you know, what has they've been through, because th- especially patients that have a devastating stroke like that, it's a huge loss and you have to mourn that loss. Uh, but you also have to realize that it, it's the new way that's the new you it's the new your new way of life and you either adapt to it or you don't so you've brought a lot of experience and knowledge in this field and you've done lots of different things within this space uh and now you're you're transitioning all of that into your role as a nursepreneur and helping other uh other nurses really look at the next chapter of their lives and what they want to do uh, with their future. Can you tell us a little bit uh, more about that and how your background with stroke patients informs what you're doing with other nurses? Yeah, absolutely. So the stroke patients really helped me to ask questions like, you know, what if or um, what would be the ideal situation or what would be the best situation to help this problem? So uh, ironically, having problems makes for business. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> every which business is, nice. <laughs> is about solving a problem for someone. Yeah, exactly. So I had lots of problems and the, the problem with some of these big hospital systems is that they're just not designed to be flexible or to integrate new programs and, and just be creatively um, expansive. So one of the things that you need to do is kind of take, really good ideas outside of the hospital system and, you know, work with them out there because getting funding inside the hospital is is almost impossible. It's kind of like research. You know, they they say it takes uh, seven to 10 years to implement research that we already know is, is, is good. Right. So it's the same with business. I could have a great business idea and maybe in seven to 10 years, the, the hospital adapt it, or, you know, we could, go out on our own and do this. So that's what I chose to do was to go out and create this transitional care program for stroke patients. And then for my nurses, I had uh, another neuro nurse that was really interested in doing personal training. And she was doing in-home personal training for like $30 an hour. And I I said, Erin, this this is just crazy. And she's like, well, I can't find any customers. Or I I, I don't know how to market to get these people in. And I said, you are a neuro nurse. I said, look at our, our stroke patients. They, we tell them to go change their lifestyle. I mean, that's really our discharge diagnosis. Good. Change your lifestyle. It's so vague. And I said, how many of these people do you think are going out to like gold's gym to join (laughs) and, and build their fitness levels up? Because a lot of the stroke patients will have, uh, they'll have um, a complex about it. They don't want to bother people. They, they don't think that the, maybe they don't think the trainer will understand their deficits. So do you understand all of that kind of stuff? So she started working with stroke patients to help them build up their, their, uh, their, their stamina and their strength and, and to get to the best person that they could be in. Uh, with their deficits. So it, it's those type of types of um, different types of business models that can really help stroke patients. That's tailored. It's very niched and it's just, it's a, it's a great way to service them and to help them find solutions. Yeah, that's awesome. And it, it also is uh, giving uh, nurses an opportunity to explore other things they want to do with their careers. Yeah, it's really because that's what we want to do. We want to educate. We want to teach. We want to make a difference in people's lives. And um, business actually allows us to do that and really show our expertise. 
Absolutely. And and for some reason or other, medical and nursing schools don't teach marketing plans and oh. and accounting <laughs> tools and and fun things no, like they that. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. And you know, it it's funny that you say that because it, it's so true. Um you know, it's almost we had the antithesis. It's almost like self-promotion or marketing is bad and and evil and and we don't do that and it's just kind of like no, you gotta you gotta tell people what you can do for them. It's it's almost our our obligation to do it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, if folks so, want to know more about you or about your programs, uh, where should they go? Well, I have a website, and it is Katie, and I'll spell that C A T I E Harris dot com. And I am also on Facebook at Nursepreneurs One. Awesome. And you'll be able to find those links over at strokecast.com slash Katie. And if you want to learn more about what Katie is doing in her speaking and some of her other uh, career oriented stuff, be sure to check out uh, her appearance on our other show over at two minute talk tips.com slash Katie is another fascinating discussion for our very first guest on both of my shows. So I'm pretty excited about that. (laughs) <laughs> Great. Thanks. So, Katie, thank you so much for joining us this week. This has been fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, Bill. And that brings us to our hack of the week, opening pill bottles. As survivors, we are likely to have at least one prescription medication, and opening childproof lids can be tough. They're Tough enough when you have two functional hands, and when you may be down to just one, yeah, there can be further challenges. Fortunately, there can also be solutions. You can actually see me demonstrate the things I'm going to talk about today over in a video I did on Facebook Live, and you can find that at strokecast.com slash pillbottle. So if you're having trouble following this, just visit strokecast.com slash pillbottle. First suggestion is that you can ask your pharmacy not to use childproof lids on your meds. If you're not worried about other folks in your household accidentally consuming your pills, it's worth asking about that. Many pharmacies can actually accommodate this request and make things easier for you. Second, take a closer look at the lid on your pill bottle. Some of them are, of course, the traditional push down and twist that that we've become accustomed to, and those can be really difficult. But lately, over the past couple of years, I've been seeing more where the bottle has a tab that you bend, and then you can unscrew the lid. In and of itself, that's not much easier. But if you look at the lid, you may see the top of it has threads. See, you can actually turn this cap over and screw it back down, upside down. And now that lid and pill bottle is just a normal, basic screw-on, screw-off lid. And you've bypassed the child safety feature for your next dosage. Check out strokecast.com slash Katie to see a picture of this type of pill bottle that I'm talking about. Or again, strokecast.com slash pill bottle to actually watch the video. So take a look at your pill bottles and give it a try. See what other options you have that you may not have noticed before. So to wrap up today, I had a great time chatting with Katie. Nursing is tough work and often underappreciated work. And when the hospital floor is no longer how someone wants to drive their career, it's great that someone like Katie is out there who can offer other options. What's been your experience with neuro nurses? Let us know in the comments over at strokecast.com slash Katie. Check out katieharris.com to learn more about Katie and her programs or visit twominutetalktips.com slash Katie to hear her talk about public speaking. To see more of Katie's links, go visit strokecast.com slash Katie and we'll get you connected to her all over the place. If you're a nurse looking for the next phase of your career, be sure to check out Katie's Nursepreneur Business Academy. Take the easy way out with alternative ways of opening your pill bottles. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you next week. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment. 
not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Strokecast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.